Hey, Gary Hoover here. You know, I believe we have so much to learn from business history, um, and we don't study business history. Our knowledge about the history of our companies, our industries, our great institutions, even like universities, libraries, museums, hospitals, we don't really talk about it much. We don't understand it. In fact, um, as far as I can tell, there's only one MBA program in the world, you know, Masters of Business Administration, where it's required that you study business history. And that's the University of Copenhagen. If somebody else knows a, uh, that somebody else does it, let me, let me know. It, it cost our society hundreds of I don't think I'm exaggerating to say it cost our society hundreds of billions of dollars from our lack of understanding of history. We make the same mistakes over and over again. So today, it's business history lesson number 27,007. So if you missed the first 27,006, we'll come back, because sooner or later I'll get to all of them, or I'll try. Anyway, today's lesson is about a great American company a big food company uh, called Kraft Foods. Now, Kraft Foods actually is evolution and, and uh, comes from uh, really uh, four former giant companies that have ended up being part of this Kraft Foods. One was General Foods, which was America's largest food company, or one of the two biggest ones back in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, made uh, Maxwell House coffee and Post cereals and Jell-O and Kool-Aid and all kinds of cool stuff, but that was General Foods. Another one was Kraft Foods. It used to be called National Dairy Products. It was a, a bunch of dairies went together and merged, and the Kraft Cheese company became part of that. Those were both big food giants. And then um, uh, the uh, rolled into the same company over time was the old Nabisco, the National Biscuit Company, which uh, owns some of the greatest brands in America, like Ritz crackers and saltines and uh, Oreos and just a very uh, uh, powerful uh, company in terms of its brand recognition and familiarity with American people, Nabisco, National Biscuit Company. And then in recent years, they added Cadbury, C-A-D-B-U-R-Y, which is a British chocolate and confectionery candy company, uh, uh, actually a company with wonderful history in terms of among the first companies to really treat their employees really well way back a couple hundred years ago and everything. Really pretty amazing story. Anyhow, all these four companies ended up being part of one giant company that went by the name of Kraft Foods. And the reason I'm shaking this here is this is an article from the Wall Street Journal dated Friday, August 5th, 2011, last Friday. And it says, Activists Pressed for Kraft Spinoff. And just a couple excerpts here. It says that Irene Rosenfeld, this lady, who was running it, the chief executive officer, CEO, uh, that she um, had only 18 months ago, she told investors, I quote, scale is a source of great competitive advantage. What she's saying there 18 months ago was getting big is important. That being big will help us be a better company and everything. Hmm. I don't know. However, she said that 18 months ago, but she took a different view this last Thursday, last week, selling a plan to separate the company's snacks and grocery businesses as a way to instill, quote, focus that will, quote, provide even greater opportunities. So here we have this very smart woman spending a lifetime in marketing, won a lot of praise. A lot of people think she's a real wizard. Got this big, huge job running. Uh, it's the United, the biggest uh, U.S.-based uh, pure food company. The biggest food company in the world is called Nestle. They're out of Switzerland. And actually, PepsiCo in the U.S. is, is, is right up there in terms of food and beverage. But a pure food company, hey, these are a bunch of giants. This is one of the real giants. So here she was doing all this, and they spent billions of dollars buying other companies saying, big is what matters. Big is what wins. Um, and now, all of a sudden, it's, oh, no, we don't, not only do we want, not want to be big, we want to be half as big as we were before. You know, cut it into two pieces. Still two real big companies, but apparently big that was so big <laughs> 18 months ago ain't so big now. I look at this, and I'm like, why do people never learn? Why do people never learn? When was big 
great. Uh, General Motors became the biggest automaker in the world, and as soon as they got there, they began their fall from glory. The great A&P, Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, grocery store chain, they became the biggest retailer in the world, and that's when they began their fall from glory. People say, oh, Walmart, it's powerful because it's so big. No, Walmart became the best-run retailer in America, and that led to them becoming the biggest not the other way around. It wasn't because they were the biggest that they're so highly respected among retailers around the world. And, and what gets me, I said I'd talk about history, is especially ironic in this case, because if you read the article, you'll find they're breaking it into two pieces, and one of the pieces is, in large part, the old Nabisco, that that's kind of the gem. That's the part that has the most exciting growth, especially in emerging, emerging markets and around the world, outside the United States. The U.S. is growing a little slower. And, and, and so the old craft brands are going into kind of the slow-growing part, and kind of the cool part is going to be, in large part, Nabisco. So I go back to my favorite book about business history. I've recommended it to you and other people over and over. It's called The Visible Hand by Alfred Chandler. And uh, it's called The Visible Hand, The Managerial Revolution in American Business. It's like, I don't know, 20, 25-year-old book, 1977, <laughs> 34 years old. And um, it's just a wonderful book because age doesn't matter in something like this because the history he talks about was already done and over with by 1977. And we haven't learned that much more new insights since then about the history of American business and how big companies came to be and how they learned to manage them. And one of his great stories, it was always one of my favorites in here, is about Nabisco, the same company I've just been talking about. And I read here on page 334, um, the National Biscuit Company, that's what became Nabisco, provides a particularly revealing example of a legal consolidation that realized the need for change in strategy. Okay, back then, this is, that company was formed in 1898, a merger of three regional consolidations, New York Biscuit Company, American Biscuit and Manufacturing, and the United States Baking Company. The, at first, the new firm carried out the policies of its predecessors, but soon decided that they did not pay. Okay, here's the story. This is like, uh, what is it, 1898. 1890s was the trust era in the United States business history. And, and big Wall Street uh, bankers, J.P. Morgan and his competitors, would go around and buy, try to buy up all the major companies in a single industry so they could dominate the industry, so they could be the biggest and the most powerful. And perhaps they thought they could stamp out all the competition. And, uh, and here they are. They've created the National Biscuit Company by merging New York Biscuit, American Biscuit, and United States Baking. So they had a huge share of all the bakeries in America that made cookies and crackers and stuff in those fields. And, and they said, oh, this way we'll own the whole market, right? They said that in 1898. Only three years later, 1901, their annual report, pardon me while I read here, their annual report says the company is four years old and it may be of interest to shortly review its history. When the company started, it was an aggregation of plants. It's now an organized business. We look back through the four years, we find a radical change has been wrought in our business. It goes on and on here. We turned our attention and strategies to improving the internal management of the company instead of buying out all our competitors and trying to take over the industries, essentially what they're saying. It became the settled policy of this company to buy out no competition. Read that line again from this 1901 annual report of the National Biscuit Company. It became the settled policy of this company to buy out no competition. That means that after only four years of existence, a company that was completely created to like buy out everybody in the industry, take over, dominate, own it. What was the lady's quote here? Scale is a source of great competitive advantage. That's the nonsense that they believed in 1898. It only took that company less than four years to find out, no, it doesn't work. The customer doesn't care if you're the biggest. The customer doesn't care if you own everything else. What works 
is making great products, focusing on improving your products, finding more efficient ways to do them. I mean, come on, how many companies over the course of its history has Microsoft bought, has Walmart bought, has UPS bought, one of the greatest companies? How many has Target bought? You know, yeah, they've bought some, but no. Their focus is do what we do and do it well and do it over and over again. That lesson has been proven repeatedly. It's in the history books. That, that annual report was written 110 years ago by this same company, the Nabisco company saying, look, it doesn't work. Because the thing is, the minute you take over everybody and own the whole industry, new guys are going to start up. Men and women entrepreneurs are going to say, wait a minute, big old stupid company, not paying attention to its customers, not paying attention to its products, all obsessed with just being big. Wow, that's, you know, when the, when the elephants dance, it's like the mice running around their feet that make the profit, whatever. And it's just to me so remarkable that this one company learned this lesson in 1901 and had to relearn it again in 2011. And I would venture to say that the odds are high, of course I don't know for sure, I would, the odds are high that the board of directors of Kraft Foods Company, written up in this story, who were kind of forced into this decision by Wall Street investors, at least encouraged to change their ways, that those managers and board of directors members of the Kraft Company and its Nabisco division have never read Alfred Chandler's The Visible Hand. Maybe if they had, they would have at least given a second thought to that strategy. And again, as I often say, having run companies before, it's a lot easier to armchair quarterback and talk about them than it is to run them. I know how hard it is. And there have been times when buying other companies or potential competitors did pay off, but in almost all those cases, it was when the buying company was one who was really obsessed with product quality and doing the right thing, and they didn't really think that it was size that, that was the great thing. But they'd find a company, it was for sale, it'd be a good fit, they bought it. I used to be on the board of directors of Whole Foods Market based here in Austin. They bought a number of other companies over the years. And in general, those acquisitions have turned out to be good things for the stockholders, for the employees, and for the customers. That's not true of most acquisitions. When the big banks buy each other, you just the customer goes from being customer number 800,000 to being customer number 8 million and gets nothing out of it. The Bisco, here's this company, had this history, learned it once, had to learn it again. I wouldn't be shocked in 100 years if they'll have, a, have to learn that lesson yet again. But I just see it over and over when I study big businesses that they don't get this one, and yet it isn't that hard to understand. This is Gary Hoover. I appreciate your time, and I'll see you later.